Hey there, I pray this video encourages you and helps you grow and become more like Jesus. Follow along with the notes linked in the description. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Enjoy. Go to Acts chapter 1, and uh, I'm titled this message, Acts 1 Church. And here's why. I believe that we need to be an Acts 1 church to become an Acts 2 church. Okay, if you read ahead, you know what I'm talking about. Last week, we learned that when Jesus resurrected, he appeared to his followers for about 40 days before he ascended into heaven. And once when he was eating with them, he said, wait for the promised gift of the Holy Spirit and you will receive power to be witnesses. We learned that it, that, that, that verse, Acts 1-8, is the key verse, and it doesn't mean that it's a command. It's actually what's going to happen. You're going to become a witness when you are filled with the Holy Spirit, when you are baptized with the Holy Spirit. We learned last week that at salvation, you've received the Holy Spirit to set you apart, to sanctify you as holy and a child of God. But we also believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which is even more of the filling and the power of the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life. And so as a church that believes in Acts 2, that believes in Pentecost and what happened, we are also asking for more of God's Spirit. Well, they knew what to do. They listened to Jesus and they went to wait in Jerusalem. Now, waiting today is much different than waiting 2,000 years ago, isn't it? I ordered something on Amazon, and it came that night. <laughs> Anyone else? You know, I was like, what? How is this at my front door already? This is impossible. You know, we live in the drive through fast food world. You know, it's, it's ready pretty fast. Unless you go to the Wendy's drive through then you're waiting for a long time. <laughs> or something like that. Um, haven't been there in a while, but it's still, maybe it's gotten better. Who knows? But... I don't know, but thank the Lord for our, our Wendy's. Thank the Lord for our workers. Anyway, point being is, all right, just in case anyone works there, I'm sorry. I wasn't trying to do that to you. All right. Uh, everyone struggles sometimes, okay? We, we struggle to wait, and what they did is they waited for 10 days for this promise to show up, and they weren't really sure what that was going to look like. They didn't know what that experience was going to be, but they knew that Jesus delivered on the resurrection. Surely he's going to deliver on this. And so they, they lived in a community where things were slower. You know, it, they took um, carriages to places. We take, you know, Camaros to places. You know, we have fast cars and they don't. So waiting is not our thing. So I believe that we're going to have to learn how to be an Acts 1 church by waiting in the presence of the Holy Spirit. Amen? So... Acts 1, 12 through 26 is where we're going to be today, and it gives us a look into what the disciples did while they waited, and it was 10 days before the Holy Spirit filled them at Pentecost, so you have 50 days where this, all this happened in Acts chapter 1 to Acts chapter 2 in the beginning, and the setting and the tone of this environment, this church at this time was one of excitement and anticipation. Jesus is alive. They're excited for whatever he promised to give them. And the church is frequently together to pray and worship at the temple or in the upper room. So let's read it in Acts chapter 1, verse 12. Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives, a distance of a half a mile. When they arrived... They went to the upstairs room of the house where they were staying. Here are the names of those who were present. Peter, John, James, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James, not Judas Iscariot, the one who died already. Verse 14. They all met together and were constantly united in prayer. Or some versions may say, in one accord and praying and joined together. Along with Mary, the mother of Jesus, several other women, and the brothers of Jesus. During this time, when about 120 believers were together in one place, Peter stood up and addressed them. Brothers, he said, the scriptures had to be fulfilled concerning Judas. I'm going to stop. Uh, well, let me finish where, where you're at right here. Um, who guided those who arrested 
Jesus. Let me stop there for a moment and, and share with you some things. Luke focuses on a few things here. And first of all, he focuses on who's present in this upper room. And there's about 120 of them. And he focuses on the 11 disciples, the women that are there, uh, especially Mary, uh, the mother of Jesus. And it was John's job to take care of her, if you recall. And then Jesus' brothers. Now, that's really interesting because uh, Jesus' brothers didn't believe him in the beginning, and now they do. So they were antagonistic towards him, and now they're with him. If you're not familiar, James, the author of the book of James, is Jesus' half-brother, and the book of Jude is Jesus' half-brother as well. Now, here's something really interesting, um, and this, I'm going to read this from Stanley Horton's commentary on the book of Acts. In those days, if one man was present, the masculine pronoun was used for the mixed group. So when, even when Peter called them brothers, this actually included the women. The Jews understood this, but Luke wanted Theophilus and other Gentiles to know the women were present and praying, so he mentioned them specifically. Isn't that interesting? So if there was women in the room and there was only one man, Peter would have to address them and say, brothers, and the Jews knew that, okay? Why is that important? Well, we're going to find out in Acts 2 that the Holy Spirit came upon all people, not just men, but women as well. Amen? And also, it goes along with this. They all met together. They were joined together. They were in one accord. It didn't matter on gender. They were in one accord together, male and female, in prayer, in worship, as the family of God. And this word here is, it means in the Greek, with one purpose or with one mind. So they had the same thing in mind. They all wanted to do the will of God, which is wait in Jerusalem for this gift from the Father. So they were all in unity. Do you know how important it is that the church is in unity and that we're all going in the same direction? It's so key that we're in unity and we're going in the same direction. How many of us want to do the will of God? Amen? So we all should want to do what God's will is. And they were a church, this Acts 1 church, they were together, and they all wanted the same thing. They wanted more of God and whatever he promised. And then they were constantly in unity or united in prayer. They were praying at the temple and in the upper room. They were worshiping. They were praising God in the temple daily, according to Luke 24, 52 through 53. They kept continuous atmosphere of prayer, praise, and worship. They were excited and occupied by this promise to receive the Holy Spirit. And again, they had no reason to doubt that Jesus wouldn't deliver. They, had, they knew that he was going to deliver on this promise and that the Holy Spirit was going to come. So they were excited and they were waiting. However... There was some business that needed to be taken care of. And this is a really interesting portion of this scripture leading us into Acts 2. And so they had a business meeting. I don't know if you're a partner at Calvary, but we have an annual business meeting where we do some vision and prayer and ministry, and we also do business. And do you know the church has to do business sometimes? That we have to be organized and take care of things and make sure we're heading in the right direction. And so this is where we're going to see this. I'm going to start with the... The next paragraph of our scripture, this was predicted long ago by the Holy Spirit, speaking through King David. So Judas, okay, let me go backwards, I'm sorry. Brothers, he said, the scriptures had to be fulfilled concerning Judas, who guided those who arrested Jesus. This was predicted long ago by the Holy Spirit, speaking through King David. Judas was one of us and shared in the ministry with us. And then Luke gives a historical detail here. Judas had bought a field with the money he received for his treachery. Falling head first there, his body split open, spilling out all his intestines. The news of his death spread to all the people of Jerusalem, and they gave the place the Aramaic name Ekadelma, which means field of blood. Peter continued, this was written in the book of Psalms, where it says, let his home become desolate with no one living in it. It also says, let someone else take his position. Pretty graphic, isn't it? Now... Some people argue that there is a contradiction in Scripture, that Matthew uh, 27 talks about um, the, the hanging of Judas 
And meanwhile, you have this other story where it seems like he jumped off a cliff or something to take his own life and his body broke open in Acts 1.18. So it's an interesting, you know, two different perspectives, which is actually common because you have Matthew who saw or heard this situation and you also had Luke who was getting the investigation of it. How do we reconcile those two differences? What actually happened? You ready for this? This is interesting. Hanging by a rope was not a practice at that time. There was only two forms of hanging, hanging on a cross or impalement. So sometimes we get this wrong, really, when we preach this or when we teach this. Uh, we, we even have probably in Christianity have seen pictures of a rope where Judas hung himself or maybe the Passion of the Christ, I think, may have even showed this. But actually hanging by a rope was not a practice during this time. So pardon me for the young ears in the room, but let me just explain what happened. Um, basically, he jumped on a, on a pole and impaled himself. And when he did this, his body broke open. And yeah, so that's what happened. So he was hanging there in, air, in the air on the pole. And so that's how you reconcile those two things. Now, this is what historians are pointing to. And so I think that's a great way of bringing those two together and saying they weren't contradicting each other at all. So, for good reason, that place is called the field of blood. And Peter remembers Psalms and says, oh, yeah, this place would be deserted and we're supposed to replace Judas. And he's referring to Psalm 69.25 and Psalm 109.8, both dealing with enemies of Israel in the time of David. But Peter applies it to Judas. So the Holy Spirit is leading Peter to, and, and the Lord is leading Peter to use these scriptures to say, oh, yeah, this field is deserted. It has been. And by the way, I looked it up. And if they, if they have the right location where Judas's field was, it is still desolate. No one lives there. It's still cursed. But they're not too sure, actually. So his, his dwelling place would be abandoned, and the church is supposed to replace. And the reason why is, um, at the time that this is being written, in David's time, this was judgment on those people who were attacking God's leadership. There was judgment on them. And so it's the same thing here. Judas attacked Jesus, so to say, by leading the Pharisees to him in the garden and selling Jesus off for 30 pieces of silver. The Pharisees wanted nothing to do with blood money, so they had purchased um, the field with that as well, and so it's been abandoned. All right? Okay, the gruesome death of Judas uh, is just a little piece here of what needs to be understood, but what's most important is Matthias. Matthias replaces Judas. So they're going to fill in the gap for the 12th apostle. Do you know what the word apostle means? It means to be sent out or dispatched. To send or to dispatch. An apostle is to be an envoy or ambassador. I want to go to 2 Corinthians real quick. 2 Corinthians um, chapter 5. Because Paul actually calls himself this. Just give me a moment here. Second Corinthians 5, and we're going to be verse 19. And the title of this section is, We Are God's Ambassadors. Verse, verse 19, 2 Corinthians 5, 19. For God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them, and he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ's ambassadors, or apostles, God is making his appeal through us. I love this. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. That's what an apostle does. Come back to God. He is sent, he preaches, and he goes out to tell people to come back to God. Now, just so you know, in, in the Bible, there's general and restrictive um, descriptions for apostles. Restrictive is the 12. Okay, there's apostles that are the 12 that Jesus chose, and then to replace that, the Judas, the body chooses the one to fill his role. And so in a restrictive sense, Matthias is the one that replaces Judas. But in general uh, sense, Barnabas and Paul were called apostles. They weren't the 12, but they were still apostles. You follow me on that? 
Because some believe that apostles don't exist because only the 12 are the true apostles. But no, Barnabas was considered an apostle. There's also a female apostle in the, in the Bible. And there's also um, Paul and others. So there were apostles who were sent by God and were sent out to preach the gospel um, from the church. Okay? Now, there's two requirements for replacing this apostle. He had to be there uh, from the beginning, and he had to see the resurrection of Jesus. So let's read that now. Verse 21. So now we must choose a replacement for Judas from among the men who were with us the entire time we were traveling with the Lord Jesus, from the time he was baptized by John until the day he was taken from us. Whoever is chosen would join us as a witness of Jesus' resurrection. Wow, so there you have it. Two requirements. Been there since his baptism and was there when he rose again. And there's only so many of them. So they nominated two men, Joseph called Barsabbas, also known as Justice, and Matthias. When they all prayed, notice that, they prayed first. Oh Lord, you know every heart. Show us which of these men you have chosen as an apostle to replace Judas in this ministry, for he has deserted us and gone where he belongs. Then they cast lots, and Matthias was selected to become an apostle with the other 11. What in the world is casting lots? That was my first question I read this years ago, and I'm glad I reviewed uh, again this week. So first of all, let it be known, they prayed first for God's will to be done, okay? That is key. All right, the Old Testament method of casting lots was probably taken from Proverbs 16.33, where it says, the lot is cast into the lap, but it's every decision or very decision is from the Lord. We may, the NLT version says, we may throw dice, but the Lord determines how they fall. Okay, so what were these? This is what historians have picked up on and have found. They were most likely stones with names inscribed on them. And so there were, may have been two stones, Matthias and Justice, okay? And they're, they're put inside this, this basket and they shake it and whatever stone comes out is the person they choose. But they believe that God's sovereign providential hand made one of them fall out. So they, it was still a God thing. It wasn't a gamble thing. All right, now, here's the thing. You never see them do this again. After the Holy Spirit came, now they relied on the Holy Spirit only to make decisions. And we'll read about that in Acts chapter 15. So, if you're trying to make a decision on a car purchase this week, <laughs> or whatever else, Toyota on one, Honda, no, I'm not saying you should do that, okay? Certainly do your research, whatever it is. Yeah. But what we can do is, first of all, we need to pray. Lord, what's your will, right? And lead and guide us on what we should do. Man, we're in, a lot of, we're in a lot of situations like that, aren't we? Same with us as a church. Just want to let you know that as a church, just to give you a little background, we get together as staff or as board or both, and we pray over decisions made for our church. All right? We pray for those things. And then we rely on the word of God and the guidance of the Holy Spirit to help us make those decisions. We would never try to make a decision on our own power or our own mind, okay? And so it's the same thing with us in my home, and I would encourage the same thing with you. So they obeyed, they waited, they prayed together, they took care of some important business, okay? He was replaced, and let me make sure I read this. Yeah, okay, and they cast lots, and Matthias was selected to become an apostle with the other 11. So it's time. It's time for the gift of the Holy Spirit to come. We don't know when this business was done. Was it done on the 10th day at the last hour? We don't know. All we know is, is they prayed together, they worshiped together, they praised God, they took care of some business, and then the Holy Spirit comes. So ready? I want to read the first four verses of the next chapter we're going to study next week. All right, on the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. Suddenly, there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm, kind of like this past weekend. 
and it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them, and everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages or tongues as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. So my friends and fellow Christians, believers, and the church, this is the beginning of not the church because the church was already established because of the new covenant of Jesus being uh, uh, resurrected, come back to life. They are, they are a brand new church. They are the first church. This is the church empowered. The Holy Spirit and his power has come to help them be witnesses. Now, how did they get to Acts 2, 1 through 4? They lived Acts 1 life. And that's what I want to focus on. The Number one, our takeaways for this, this message today, for us in a practical sense, the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit was a necessity for the church then, and he's a necessity for us today. But you will receive power. It doesn't say, uh, and I love our worship team, it doesn't say, and you will receive an amazing worship team. It doesn't say you will, you will receive a very charismatic, outgoing pastor. I think on that. I think, I, I think on that. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't say you'll receive a new shiny building. You will receive coffee. To be witnesses. No, it says you will receive power. And that power is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. You will receive talents, not, not right away. You receive the Holy Spirit and he gives you gifts and abilities. We, we will see those in action in the book of Acts. This is what we need. We need the Holy Spirit, church. We need that. We don't, we, we don't need fluff and we don't need a bunch of other things. I mean, thank the Lord for God using his people to use their gifts on stage. And for pastors and teachers, apostles, prophets, evangelists, thank the Lord for those. But all of those, without the Holy Spirit, there's no life coming from them. Right? There's no power coming from them. Okay? I wouldn't want to be up here if I didn't have the help of the Holy Spirit. I can tell you that right now. You won't catch me up here unless I've been prayed up, read the word, and I'm trusting the Holy Spirit. All right, we need, and, some, and I'm not perfect, so some days I have rough days. That's just the way it is. Our worship team's gonna have rough days. Our volunteers, our serving team, our dream team, they're gonna have rough days, but we depend on the Holy Spirit here. You may think we depend on coffee because we're always drinking it, but that's not the case. That's not true. We depend on the Holy Spirit. And we're living in such a world that we're dealing with spiritual powers, principalities, and forces, it's going to take the Holy Spirit to deal with those. Okay? Not just good ideas. We need God ideas. We need God inspiration. God help. Amen. So, I want to encourage you with this. Seek first the kingdom of God before you seek anything else. Seek first his kingdom. Seek first what he has for you. We don't have to accomplish the task of being witnesses of the gospel by ourselves. We have the help of the Holy Spirit. If you go into a situation where you're about to pray for someone, don't go in alone. Ask for the Holy Spirit to be with you and help you. All right, if you're getting, going into a situation at work where you're at a lunch break and you're about to be a light for someone, ask the Holy Spirit to shine brightly in your life and through your life. Take the Holy Spirit to work with you, all right, and let him work. Secondly, to be an Acts church, we need to be an Acts 1 church. What do I mean? To be a spirit-filled church, we need to be a united in prayer church. We need to pray, and we need to be in one accord with one another. So a few things. Together in one accord, pursuing the will of God. Now, that takes some altering of our lives doesn't it? It takes some altering of our priorities together. Can you imagine? Like if 12 people could change the world in the Bible with Jesus' help or the 120 
that are about to be activated by the, the Holy Spirit in Acts 2. Can you imagine what a church our size could do if we're in one accord and empowered by the Holy Spirit? Oh my goodness. We're gonna reach Delaware for Christ. Wow. Pursuing the will of God, pursuing the presence of God. Number two, uh, together in one accord, praying and worshiping, okay? Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. We're supposed to connect with God. We're supposed to fellowship with God so that the vine can feed the branches life, all right? Now, I'm gonna use this as an analogy because, and let let me say this first. I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. A prayerful life pursues fellowship with God and creates an atmosphere where God can fellowship and give you his gift. A hurried life is less capable of fellowship with the giver, let alone receiving the gifts he has for us. Let me say that again. A prayerful life pursues fellowship with God and creates an atmosphere where God can fellowship and give you his gift. Because you show up and you wait. A hurried life is less capable of fellowship with the giver, God, let alone receiving the gifts he has for us. Let's say this is God. My wife said, please don't break it. And don't put water in it. She said, don't put water in it. I won't. Okay, no water today. All right. This is us. You see how small that opening is? Uh, Okay, you want to zoom in? You can. Maybe. That's small. Okay. Okay. And this is us sometimes, just busy doing life. And and, uh, got to go here, got to go here, got to get up, got to do this. Oh, got to do this. Oh, got to do this. And God's just like waiting. He's just waiting. And we're just like, oh, okay, we're at church. Whoop, well, time to go. It's been an hour and 15 minutes. (laughs) Whoop. Whoop. Lunch was good at Texas Roadhouse. Whoop. Oh, it's time to do chores for the week. It's time to fold laundry. Whoop. I mean, that's our life, right? Let's just be honest. And meanwhile, there is this huge vessel of heavenly outpouring of God's presence and his spirit just waiting for us. And we got to slow down long enough for that little area to be filled with his power. This is what he, this is what happened. Yes. Isn't it interesting how one little visual can help make things make sense? Like, this is the Acts 1 church. They waited. And while they waited, they fellowshiped, they prayed, they worshiped, they were praising God because he's alive. That's what we did today, right? And we waited long enough, and God's just like, that's what it means to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. They were ready to receive. It doesn't matter if he gets in there. It doesn't, he's not going to go up to, when, it, when they were filled with the Holy Spirit in Acts 2, it wasn't like, hmm. No, it was like this. How cool is that? All right, God, I'm going to put you right here. <laughs> You're good. My wife's okay, too. She's happy. I didn't break it. And so here's a suggestion for us, just to create that atmosphere he, even here. And I would, I would encourage you to create the atmosphere at your home. Of, of slowing down and waiting and praying and worshiping in your car. You know, I, I've been filled with the Holy Spirit in the car. I kept my eyes open, but I was. I was driving to college, praying for people, and I began to pray in other tongues for people in the Spirit. As I, I was crying, too. I was so emotional. I was like, you know, trying to get the tears out of my eyes. But how about we come in 10 to 15 minutes before church and just begin to pray? And I know it, it could get a little loud in here because we're fellowshipping. Maybe we just fellowship a little quieter as people are praying for each other and praying um, or fellowship in the lobby after you grab some seats and stuff. But what if we create an atmosphere of prayer before we even start worshiping with an expectation that God's going to fill us and move in this place and heal and restore and do work. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. And then together in one accord, I said this already, but they were preparing themselves for service I know, you ready for this? It was, they were doing business. They were getting the, the last apostle replaced. But you know what? They were preparing themselves for the church to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. 
Maybe there's some things in your life that you need to reorient and fix, some schedules, some things like that, or your own heart, your own mind. Prepare yourself to receive. If we have to adjust, you know, our, our coming in on Sunday morning to be more prayerful before service, then let's prepare ourselves to be poured into by the Holy Spirit, right? Take care of some business like that. If we need to get here earlier by leaving earlier, then take care of business like that. You see what I'm saying? We, we prepare ourselves. They prepared themselves. They did everything they needed to do, all right? Because there needed to be 12 apostles. So they did what they had to do, and then the Holy Spirit came and filled them. And lastly, so the first two takeaways, let me review. The presence and power of the Holy Spirit was a necessity for the church then, and he is today. To be a spirit-filled church, we need to be united in prayer church. And we're working on that. We need to pray more and consistently. We pray in our groups. We pray here on Sunday mornings. We pray on October 4th. We have a prayer night here. It was powerful. Last Wednesday night, the last prayer night, it was powerful. Come together on Wednesday night, October 4th. Let's pray together, all right? And, uh, but lastly, the Lord freely gives the Holy Spirit. I'm grateful for a brother in Christ who reminded me of this scripture last week. Um, it's, it was actually in my list of things, but I think it's perfect for this week in particular. Luke 11, 11 through 13, when Jesus was teaching the disciples to pray, he said this, you fathers, if your children ask for a fish, do you give them a snake instead? Or if they ask for an egg, do you give them a scorpion? Of course not. So if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Praise the Lord. And it says in the verses before that, ask and keep asking. Keep knocking. Be persistent. Keep asking. You didn't get filled today? Ask tonight. Ask tomorrow. Keep seeking the Holy Spirit. Keep surrendering your life. Keep opening your life up to the Lord. Get it, get it ready. Church, I, I don't know how many times we got to say this. Time is running out. And it's not about us getting taken up right now. For me, that's not my priority. We need to be ready. My priority is other people know to be ready. That's my priority. I want people to know Jesus. Right now, we're in the era of where we're supposed to be witnesses of the gospel. Okay? That's what the Lord says to focus on is helping people be ready for his return. I'm ready, but my neighbors aren't. The waiters and waitresses at the, grocery, or at the uh, restaurants today and the clerks at the grocery stores and all those places, they're not ready all the time. Now, some of them are, praise the Lord. You find out when you evangelize, but everyone is not ready in our world. And that is what we need to be preoccupied with right now. And one of the ways we do that is we become an Acts 1 church so we're filled with the Acts 2 power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let me stand together. Thank you, God. You know, the Lord had to convict me again this week. When you get a lot on your plate and you got a lot going on in your life and a lot of things that can cause worry or fear, one of the first persons to suffer is God. He doesn't suffer really, but you know what I mean. We don't spend time with him. He's the first one that, that loses time. And so the Lord just convicted me to really set aside things and not be distracted and just soak up his presence again in my living room at my house. I have a quiet spot I can be at, thank the Lord. And, and so he was just reminding me to come back to that place, slow down enough so that I can pour into you. And so church, I don't know if there's anything in your life that's really preoccupying your, your concentration and your time. I don't know, if, have you ever felt like you start to pray and you, you can't even concentrate on the prayers because there's so much going on? Well, we all have been there. And the Lord is saying, deal with that so you can be ready to receive. Work on that, ask for his help to clear your heart, clear your mind, to, to get rid of the anxious thoughts Scripture teaches us to, to not worry, but to give our, our worries to the Lord, to pray, Philippians 4, 6. So to give those things over to him. And so I just want to encourage you this week to really create an atmosphere in your home, in your car, wherever you can be, and also on Sunday mornings when you come here, 
because we need his power. We need to be an Acts 2 church. And he freely gives his spirit to those who ask and keep asking. So let's pray. Lord, we know right now you can pour your spirit into us, Lord God. We ask you do that. And God, give us the ability and the help, Lord, to get our lives organized around you and not you having to fit into our lives. Lord, help us to slow down enough so you can just dump your spirit, pour out in such a huge way. Lord, just overflow us, Lord God, your spirit. Just, Lord, be able to receive that. God, help us to slow down to be in fellowship with you. God, we thank you, God, that you also fill us in ways we wouldn't expect. We can't put you in a box. All we're saying today, Lord, is we need you and we want to make ourselves more available to you. Help us to be the Acts 1 church so we can be an Acts 2 church. I thank you, God, for my brothers and sisters in this place that you have saved, that you have sanctified, and that you have filled. And pray you continue to do that, Lord. Fresh feelings, Lord. Fresh outpourings of your spirit. Help us, Lord, to be the church you've called us to be. Help us to reach the lost in the days we're living in. We thank you, God, for this word today and your guidance. We give you all the glory and praise. In Jesus' name, amen.